Hello and welcome to another presentation in the Ladal Opening Webinar Series 2021. My name is Martin Schweinberger and together with, uh, together with Michael Hall, I'm co-directing Ladal, the Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory in the School of Languages and Cultures at the University of Queensland, Australia. Before we start, I'd like to read out an acknowledgement of country, which we do here in Australia to express respect and gratitude towards the Indigenous people of Australia. So I'd like to say that we as members of the University of Queensland acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship uh, of the lands from which we are broadcasting this webinar. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual uh, connections to country. I would also like to say that we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian as well as global society. If you want to know more about Adal and the resources we provide, please feel free to explore the Adal website. Um, the URL is on the screen. Uh, you can also find information about past and upcoming presentations in the Adal opening webinar series 2021 on the event subpage uh, for the webinar series. And if you want to keep up with what's going on uh, at Adal, please feel free to follow us on Twitter. And if you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to us by email. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker, who's had quite a profound impact on many people working with corpus data, uh, including myself and many others. Uh, it's Lawrence Anthony. Lawrence is Professor of Applied Linguistics at the Faculty of Science and Engineering at Waseda University in Tokyo, Japan. He's the current director of the Center for English Language Education in Science and Engineering, which runs uh, the discipline-specific language courses for the 10,000 students of the faculty. His main research interests are in corpus linguistics, educational technology, and English for specific purposes, as well as program design and teaching methodologies. He received the National Prize for the Japan Association of English Corpus Studies, JAX, in 2012, for his work in corpus software tools design. So it's really a pleasure and an honor to have you here. And I'm happy to hand over to you to listen what you have to say about an introduction to Ankong 4. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, for that introduction. Uh, let me uh, share my screen and then yeah. we can get started. Okay, so you should be seeing here a blank screen, but I will now launch the um, slides that I have, uh, which you should now be able to see. And Martin, I hope you can see those too. And if you can't, just let me know. So uh, it's first, fine. I should. Great. So first, I should say it's an honor to be able to present uh, this uh, Ladal opening webinar seminar uh, series. Uh, the center itself it seems to be doing really excellent work um for the for the whole field and um, i really hope it continues to develop as it is um, it looks extremely um, impressive work that's been done there so today i'm going to be talking about um ANCONC 4 which is a little bit unusual because i very rarely give presentations just about ANCONC. in fact i've probably only given like two or three the whole of my career. Uh, so uh, it's going to be kind of interesting today to talk about Ankong. Uh, and I'm talking about it today because I have, have I'm just about to release version 4.0, which is a, a quite a big change to the program. In fact, it's a complete rewrite of the program. But as you'll see today, the look and feel of the software is quite similar to um, Ankong 3 and going backwards, but it does have some nice new features, which I think a lot of people will be interested in seeing. Um, so uh, that's what I want to talk about mainly today. But because we are at Ladal, um, which has a, a mission to kind of train people, educate people in a variety of corpus methods and approaches, I did want to discuss the, the, the role of Ankong and prepackaged software in the field as a whole you know what role does the what role do these packages play and how do they compare for example with um, programming or scripts and so on i do want to touch on that a little bit at the end and i also um, hope to talk a little bit about how to go about designing a software tool for a broad user base like ANCONG has where the users could be in the thousands or hundreds of thousands and they the 
the reasons for using the software can vary considerably. So I'll, again, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Okay, now um, this is being recorded, so if you um, if you have any questions, you can ask in the session, but you might want to go back and watch the video again, or you can email me, as you can see on the screen, at anthonyandwasada.jp if you have any questions about the talk. Okay, so I'll start with a, a, a bit of a background, almost motivation for the software itself, um, talk about dealing with complexity in language and linguistics research, and talk a little bit about the trends that I see in the field. Um, then. I'll be introducing Ankong 4. I'll talk about its background, its strengths and its weaknesses, and then I'll do a full demonstration of the tools and features um, using some, some fairly well-known corpora and also some user-based corpora. Now, we only have one hour, so um, I won't go into a lot of the details, but I hope you'll get an idea of how it's working. And then, as I said, I'll talk briefly at the end about developing software for a broad user base and what considerations to have and what concerns do I have as a developer um, building this kind of software. Okay, so let's start with this complexity issue. So uh, we're, most of us are probably working with language data, maybe in comp corpus linguistics, and the field has changed quite a lot, especially over the last 20 years or so. so Traditionally, we, um, corpus linguistics and what we're, most of us are working in is the area of applied linguistics, of course. And maybe some of you are in digital humanities, um, working with data as it applies in, in social studies and the world at large. And this has been fine for a long time, but what's recently been happening is this growth of data science. The big data, using more advanced methods to analyze language data and numeric data and to get new discoveries. So corpus linguistics has traditionally been almost kind of in this area of applied linguistics and humanities. Let me put my pointer on here. Maybe that will be easier to see. OK, uh, so in applied linguistics or digital humanities. But once we bring in data science, then things get a little bit more complicated. Um, so in some sense, our field is evolving from just corpus linguistics into a, a, a kind of language data science. And uh, my, the motivation for developing the new version of ANCONC is partly to address these changes in the field. So what changes do we have? Um, well, the first is this big data issue. We've gone from what was traditionally considered to be big data. Uh, for example, the 1960s and 70s, we had these one million word corpora. And in some fields, even now, one million words of data is still considered big. And then, but then in the 80s, we started getting the, the Cobell corpus of 80 million and then words. And then the, in the 1990s, the BNC at 100 million words. And then from the 2000 on, we get an increasingly large data set that we want to be looking at. So this is a graph showing, a figure showing the, the growth and brown is invisible here when compared to something like the Oxford English corpus of of 2.5 billion words. But then we also have things like the Google web trillion word corpus. And if we put that against the others, you can see a completely different scale of data. So we've, we really need to start thinking about how to develop software that can deal with big data sets or even bigger data sets like this. That's the first trend. And traditionally, if you've used ANCONC in the past, you'll, have, you'll know that it, it, tends, it tended to work best with these, what would now be considered small data sets of brown corpus level, maybe co Cobill level. But when we get to the BNC and bigger, it would become a major problem. There's also a, an increase in complexity of statistical methods being, being used in the field, partly as a result of the larger data sets, but also the increased sophistication of the, of the field and the analysis. Um, uh, there was an interesting uh, presentation last year at ICAME, which later turned into a paper um, from Larson, Egbert, and Biber. Uh, Do corpus linguists focus on statistics at the expense of linguistic analysis? And that's an interesting discussion, um, probably for a different day. But what they did find was when they looked at research over the last 20 years or so, Oh, well, from 2009 up to 2019, so 10 years, they did see an increase in the just the, the raw statistical methods that are being applied to data. And uh, they have some concerns with that, but it is definitely a, a growing trend in the field to use more complicated methods. And again, we need to have software that can um, more easily 
uh, adapt to different methods and especially different visualization approaches and so on. And again, Ancon 4.0 has been uh, created with that in mind to some to some degree. So uh, those are that's a very brief background to uh, the complexity issue. And we could talk about other things like the increased use of social media data, uh, the more the increasing interest in multimodal data, uh, diachronic data, and so on. Um, so Ancon 4 has really been developed to try and address some of these needs, certainly not all of them. Um, so let me just briefly talk about then this Ancon 4 program and uh, where it's come from. So Ancon 4 is part of a, a family of tools that you may know I've developed um, it at the, uh, on my website called uh, www.laurenceanthony.net. Uh, I, I often call it the AntLab tools. Uh, if you go to the website, uh, you'll see that there's about 20, 20 tools, and they do various different things related to corpus research. For example, you'll see on this screen um, the data collection tools I have, like Ant Core Gen, which is an automatic da data collection tool, and File Converter, which will convert PDF files and Word files and so on into raw text data, a file splitting tool, uh, and a Fire Ant tool, which is for social media data collection and some analysis as well. And then we've got cleaning tools like Encodant, uh, Sarant, and Segmentant, which I won't talk about today. But if you're interested, just go to the website and have a look. Data annotation tools like AntMover. Oh, um, and so I can see some comments. I can only see Lawrence. Can you not see the slides? I hope. Can somebody confirm that they can see my slides? Yeah, we can see the slides. We're just uh, about. Being, being able to see Martin's face instead of yours for some oh. people, but not everyone. Okay, 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 great. Thank you, thank you. I was thinking if you could only see my face, that this this presentation would be not so um, easy to follow. That's great. Uh, but Martin's black rectangle. Okay, I'm here, everybody. I hope you can see me. Anyway, let's continue. So there are some. I've created some data annotation tools as well. Um, and mover does discourse analysis um tagging uh, clause and is for the clause tagger if you've known that if you know that segment and is for non-english languages like especially for japanese and chinese to segment and then tag those and tag and is a an interface around the tree tagger tool um which people if if you've tried to use tree tagger um it can be quite difficult uh, so this is a wrapper for that uh and then I've got some data analysis tools, and the one I'm talking about today is AntConc. But there are a few others here if you're interested and have a look at them. Lawrence, just real yeah. quick, I'm sorry. Um, I tried to fix it. And now the problem that I'm having is that you're big and the slides are small. Oh. Just to let you know, just changed this problem. I think you'd have Wait. to. Shall I maybe try that. and do something? Um, can you try? to share your screen again. Okay, let me try that. Okay. I'm sorry about this. I just tried to, to sort the issue out. Okay. I'm going to try now. How about, is that better? It's okay for me. It's working for some. Oh, it's, most people seem to be okay. Maybe it's their settings that have changed. Right. Uh, Sinhanu is saying it's fine. Yeah. If a All couple right. more people can confirm, yes, it's fine with Keith and Michael. Yeah, it looks okay. Right. Takumi saying okay. it's good. Thanks so Great. much, and sorry so, about that. No problem whatsoever. Okay, so uh, I've been developing all the a lot of these tools, but Anconc is the the first tool that I developed um, back in two thousand and three, and it is kind of my baby. The what the the tool that I've worked on probably the most and certainly has the biggest user group of the tools that I have. And um, so I want to focus on that from now. So just a second. Just one moment. OK, so um, Anconk, many of you probably have used Anconk in the past. And if you haven't, please give, definitely give it a try. It's difficult to uh, get a feel of how many people use this software, um, but one quite important study was carried out by Chris Tribble back in 2012, where he asked a lot of corpus linguists, um, part of the TALC conference, um, which computer programs do they use for analyzing corpora? 
uh, and the, he had 891 responses, and this is the result. And as you can see here, a lot of people use Corpus BYU, which is um, the, the Brigham Young uh, family of corpora and the tools to access them. And then we see these downloadable tools like Anconk and Wordsmith tools, and then a quick, a, a, a rapid fall off from there. So you can see Anconk and Wordsmith tools are, were in 2012 fairly popular. What happened since then, it's, it's difficult to know because we don't have a, a survey of, the, of this form. But um, looking at the Anconk downloads since that time, so this is 2012, and I finished at 2018, I should really update this. Uh, but you can see that there was a rapid, rapid growth in downloads. This is, this is single downloads from my website. Um, so in 2018, there was 640,000 downloads from the website. But as you can imagine, it's also easy to distribute it to other people and just make copies and so on. So I would expect the numbers to be much higher than that now. Uh, and for, as an example, at Waseda University here in Japan, this software is installed on every computer in the university. So that's catering for 50,000 students. But of course, not every student is going to be using Ankong. Uh, just a, a few more stats for, for interest. It, I did check on the, the location of the downloads, and um, they, they came from over 140 countries. And I do have a YouTube tutorial video site where the tutorial videos have been viewed 500,000 times. So that kind of matches up to some degree with the downloads as well. So this is kind of astonishing for me because it didn't start out as a project that I expected or even intended to grow to this scale. Anconk started out as just a, an experiment in programming for my PhD, which was a, to develop a completely different software tool. Um, so Ankong started out basically as just a, a, a practice tool for me to, to develop my coding skills so that I could develop something for my PhD, which ended up not being used that much at all. <laughs> kind of a, ironic in a way. Um, but since then, uh, I've been developing it over time. So I can talk about now what are the, the strengths and weaknesses of the, the new versions. And it's good to consider what the the weaknesses are as well, because that's where we can start thinking about programming and other scripts and so on. So in terms of Antconk's success in some sense, I think it probably the main strength is that it's easy to find, set up and use. Um, anybody can go on Google and just type Antconk and probably the first hit they'll get is the website and then they'll see a, a download link where they can literally just download it. That I can quickly show you um, my website um, which looks like this. And of course, if you just go to the software page and you'll see a list of the software and it's right at the top there. So pretty easy to understand Windows, Macintosh, Linux. And today's software is already on the website. If you're interested, you could click that now and download it and try it. So this is Windows 10 4.0 release candidate 2. And that's what I'm going to be demonstrating in a few moments. So I think this, this um, one of the main strengths of any kind of software. So if you're developing your own kind, your own software, it's really important that people can find it and set it up and use it. One of the real problems with something like Tree Tagger, which is a fantastic part of Speech Tagger, is that it's it's easy to find, but it's not easy to set up and use, and people struggle for a long time with that. So uh, Ancon comes out as a single file executable. So you double click it and it just runs. It doesn't require any security permission. Well, sorry, it requires security permissions to use, the, to use on the system, but it doesn't use the registry and it will probably pass through most university security as well because it doesn't require any additional resources than its own. And it's also important that these software tools are documented. So Ancon comes with a help guide built into it. it. There are YouTube tutorial videos, there's a discussion forum and so on. So a lot of people who use software are going to struggle at the very, very first step. Where is the software? How do we install it? What does it do? So I think uh, it's really important and it has been an important feature of Ancon to be easy to find use and use. But that's not all, of course. I think another issue for a lot of software users is, is the software safe? Is it reliable? Does it work? And again, Ancon's got an advantage here 
um, first, in, in this terms of safety, people are going to trust, generally trust a website from a university faculty member. Because if the software contained malware or viruses, I would have people contacting my university about it. Um, so I think there's a, a face value there. People look at the developer and think, okay, it's probably going to be okay. And they can, they can also email me directly and speak to me like in this session and ask about problems and so on. So a lot of users will be worried about using new software. Is it reliable? Does it work? And having um, the ability to speak directly with people will circumnavigate some of that. So we, I get a lot of people in the community of Ancon users emailing me with errors and bugs. Well, there aren't, there's not so many bugs now, which is good, but issues and problems and so on. And that leads to bug fixes and updates. So if you look, um, the, the previous um, release was 3.5.9. So that's nine bug fixes to a version 3.9, which developed from 3.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 onwards. So that kind of gives you the idea of, of that. And you'll notice already, I haven't even talked about the features of the program. I'm talking more about the, the kind of culture or the environment around the software. Another thing that people are uh, worry about is, is it going to continue developing? Uh, lots of software gets created and dies. A lot of university projects are basically funded projects that die at the end of the funding. And they, the website that people were relying on can suddenly disappear. The software can suddenly break and it can be a major problem. Uh, I think pe many people will know about the MyCase project in the US um, that, that had a lot of support originally and then suddenly the support disappeared and the site went offline, it came back online, it went back offline again. Right now, I don't even know what the status of that is. I, I assume it's still working, but that's the, an issue of, again, the safety, reliability, but also this evolution of the software. Is it going to be developed is it going to be continued to be developed with new tools and new features, new documentation for the new features and so on? And Anconc has a, a strong history of having that, which I feel quite proud about. And then we get really to the, the tools themselves. Um, Anconc itself is generally considered to be comprehensive in the sense that it does most of the kind of core things that corpus researchers would be interested in. It has a keywording context Concomms, uh, it's got a plot tool so to plot dispersion. It's got file, you can view the files. It has clusters and engrams and collocates analysis and word and keyword lists. But it has not any, it doesn't have any of the fancy new statistical methods and visualization techniques that you would find, for example, if you start programming R yourself or um, using R scripts that other people have created. It won't have those in it. Right now, it doesn't have those. One of the main problems that Ancon has had in the past is it's pretty slow. As I said, it, it works with small corpora and it kind of processes them um, in a slow way, uh, reading each file separately, processing each file and pr printing the results to the screen. One big change with Ancon 4 is that it now uses a fully indexed SQLite database. So it's all indexed in the same kind of way as Sketch Engine or, or BNC Web, uh, uh, CQP Web, uh, Brigham Young's Corpus, and so on. So it's got a, a, a similar, I wouldn't say it's, a, it's definitely not this identical, but it's similar in its architecture to these large scale Corpus tools. And that gives it a, the power to be able to process big corpora like the BNC and so on. Once an important feature as well is that because I'm using this SQLite database, it means that the database itself is open to be viewed by anybody. So if you have a, a simple SQLite database reader, which is just free to download from the internet, you can then look at the inside of the database and see all the tables for the quick concordances and the word list and the keyword list and the collocates and so on. And more importantly than that, it, you can have data interoperability, which means that you can take the data from Anconc and put it into other tools. And similarly, you could generate a table from another tool and put it into Anconc and have Anconc visualize that data as well. So this is a kind of a really important feature that's coming into Anconc 4.0, which hasn't been possible in the past. And I'll show you that in a moment as well. 
but it, this software is designed for a broad user base. And I said, but there, but it is its strength in the sense that a lot of people can just start using it and basically it's going to be fine. Just a second, I just want to make sure I can see everybody. There we go. Yeah, okay, I'm just making sure there's no comments or anything. Good. So uh, it's it, because it has been, it's easy to find, set up, use, it's basically safe, it's basically reliable, it basically has all the features that most people are going to be using at some point. And because it has multi platform support for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and multilingual support in that it works with any language. It's, um, it's a very general purpose tool. It doesn't expect English data, for example. It, it expects the data that you give it. And that means that a lot of people might start out with Anconc, and perhaps uh, people can do most of their research with this single tool. Uh, so those are the strengths, I would say. But, uh, oh, and I should just mention about who are the users here. So I talk about this broad user base. So I would, Originally, Anconc was developed for L2 learners in the technical writing classroom. It started out as a practice tool, um, but I was thinking about using it in a technical writing class for data-driven learning. And that's where it started. So it wasn't even designed for corpus linguists. But as it developed, I did notice a lot of people who do discourse analysis, critical discourse analysis, uh, maybe work for translators started using it, um, language teachers started using it, and then more recently, I would say more corpus linguists are, are using it. But you can see that the general user base are people who would not be coding themselves. They, they may not know how to do it, or maybe they don't want to be coding all of their own tools because they have more important things to do, like linguistics research. So Ankong's broad user base is is people who are basically going to be using software to get to do their research, to do their analysis, to do their teaching, to do their learning. People who are not going to be so techy, who are going to be wanting to look inside the code and see how it works. And maybe people who are not so interested in maybe contributing and changing it. So that's where I would say the user base is. And it's a big user base, as I was showing with those with those downloads. What are the weaknesses then? So it's designed for a broad user base, and that instantly introduces a whole lot of problems. Because if you have a broad user base, you can't start introducing lots of features and functions and tools that most people aren't going to need, because it becomes bloatware and difficult to use for the majority. So it only has the standard corpus tools and statistics. It does follow best practices, but it, it is it's simple by design, I would say. It's also a black box technology in the sense that the software is freeware, but it's not open source. You can't just go to the website and download the source code and start looking at it and changing it and so on. Um, Schweinberger, um, our host today, said uh, in, back in 2020 at the ICANN conference, tools are black boxes that hinder replication due to limited accessibility and or time constraints. And in some sense, that's true. You can't see how Anconc is working. So in some sense, it's difficult to replicate the way that Anconc works with other tools, for example. I would argue, though, that you can replicate the results of Anconc very easily by simply downloading the version that was used to create the original report, for example, and then running the, the data again. So it's really important that versioning is clear when, when people download the software and when people report on software use they really need to put which version of the software they were using. Um, and a lot of software developers seem to forget about this important point and don't put the versions on, especially when it comes to online tools. For example, if you used um, Coca today, which version are you using? Is it the same version that will be there tomorrow or next week? Um, that can be a kind of a, a, a problem. Uh, so it does, it is limited in the sense that it is a bit of a black box technology. And it is inflexible, of, of course, because it's developed by me for everybody. And if, if I don't add the feature that somebody wants, it's not going to be there. Uh, so as, uh, as I say here, users can, cannot easily add new features or statistical methods to the tool. And uh, going right back to 2011, Stefan Gries said, inflexible software creates inflexible researchers. And I think that's really true. If you, if you 
locked into a, a, a software package like Anconc and don't go beyond that, then you are becoming, you will be in, um, limited in the research that you can do. I think it's really important to understand what the software can do and then, but always start with your own research questions and your own aims. If the software cannot do that, then it's the time to think about going beyond that software. So the, the, the strengths and the weaknesses are kind of together there. Okay, so let me show you then um, uh, what Anconc 4 looks like and try and demonstrate some of these new features that allow it to address some of the issues that I've just been talking about and um, see what you think. Okay, so um, let me close the slide for a moment and um, bring up the uh, software itself. Just a moment. Okay, so this is the software and just hope that you can all see that. Okay, so um, as you, if you're familiar with Anconc in the past, you'll think, oh, this looks like exactly like the current version. There's no difference at all. Um, and that is by design. I, when people launch a program, it shouldn't suddenly look completely different to things that they were, they were used to in the past. But I, as I repeat, everything here is completely new. It's, it's written from the ground up. So if you're not familiar with um, Anconc, let me just briefly describe what, what you're looking at here. Oh, but first of all, of course, um, as it's developed for a teaching, as a teaching tool, in a classroom, you don't want to be in a situation where you're, where you're having students looking at these very small fonts. So you need to be able to make the screen, or at least the software, easier to see. So I'm just going to change the global settings here. Just a minute. Okay, I can see some comments there. I'll talk about that later. I'm just going to change the font now to something that you can all hopefully see a bit better. Okay, so now the software, I hope, is now bigger and easier to see. Is that good for everybody? I hope you can all see that. I haven't gone full screen yet because I, I want to show some other things. So um, you can see that the software now has all, every menu and button is now clearly, hopefully visible. And you can see that it has these different tools at the top, which are the standard tools in the field, I would say, quick, plot, file, cluster, engram, colligate, and so on. Okay, and on the left is the, the corpus that you're going to analyze and you start out without a corpus at all. And this has always been a problem for um, corpus users is where is the data? And Ancon traditionally had required you to load in your own data and that could be a serious problem for some people. What this new version has now is something called a corpus manager, which allows you to basically load in your own data or use a pre-built corpus. I hope you can see those in here. I've had permission to include um, the AMIO6. This is a 1 million word corpus of um, American English and the BEO6, which is a 1 million corpus of British English and their sub corpora as well. So this allows you, so people who are not familiar with corpus linguistics tools and data to very quickly start using the tool. So I'm gonna do that right now. And I'm going to pick a sub corpus of academic English, which is AMIO6 uh, J. Now, Normally, again, it would not be so easy to use a corpus like this, but with this tool, because it's now a database, as you can maybe see here, I've just clicked on the database and that's it. I've now loaded this AMIO6 learned corpus into the tool. Okay, I hope you can see that. Now it kind of works as it as the traditional tool did. And now you can basically analyze this sub corpus in any way you like. So for example, I could um, go to the quick concordancer. I can type in a word like we, which I'm gonna be using for um, quite a lot for this demonstration. As you can see here, we get the concordance lines showing up. Yeah, very traditional concordance view. And a lot of people like this um, view because they can start looking at patterns and what they would tend to do. Oh, and you should notice that it's paged as well because this can now deal with much bigger corpora and you don't want to end up having to see thousands and thousands of hits at the same time. Of course, you can just show all the hits if you really want to, but that would only be when you have a lot, when you have a small data set. What's really, really surprising about corp quick corpus tools, traditional corpus tools, is that they would have this quick concordancer and you would have to scroll down and try and find common patterns. And you can see here, we can is appearing fairly commonly and we cannot. 
and you basically have to by by eye identify the common patterns and you see here have seems to be a common pattern and this has been the traditional view view since the 1960s with no change this astonished me for many years and finally i've put in something that i proposed in 2013 which is to instead of order by alphabetical which is what it standard it lead uh, it, which is what the standard is you can order by frequency and that means it's going to order the results by the most frequent patterns to the left or to the right and for any kind of language learning data driven learning pattern finding and so on this makes much more sense so i as i feel it does so it is an option you don't have to use it but if you turn on this order by frequency immediately you can see that we have is the most dominant pattern going all the way through and then we are and can and will comes up and may so you can see modal verb usage is commonly appearing after the we we can we may we might and uh, we and then other things like we cannot we see and so on so this is just an example of of the quick concordance in action of course we can click on one of these words and see it um, in the original text, this is the original text, and what happened there is the software jumped from the quick concordance tool to the file view tool to see where it appeared in context. But you can click any tool to be able to, uh, any file to be able to see the original. It looks just like the old tool, um, although this is all database actions. When I click on this file, I'm not actually clicking on the original file, I'm just going to a database and scanning through the database and producing this view of the data dynamically. Okay, so that's, the, uh, that's a quick example of quick, and we have things like plot tool, where we can also plot all the results for plot. And here you can see, hopefully you can see that. So these are all the plot lines which used to appear in Ancon, but what we can also see now is some statistical data. And again, this is really important if you want to continue this analysis with other tools later. Maybe you want to visualize the dispersion with a different tool. So you can export this data and put it straight into another tool, uh, as I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. But you can see here that we have the dispersion of we across this academic corpus, and we is well, not used consistently by authors. It's used um, in a variety of ways. Uh, what's interesting is sometimes you want to be able to see, compare the results. So I can, for example, look for I, but not, not um, just plot a different plot, put it as an overlay over the original results. And now I can, I hope you can see this, um, but the blue is the we and the, the red is the I usage and you can see that some people use only we and a couple of people use only i not so many and then we have some people here basically using all we and they have one occurrence of i and then kind of mixture of the two and if you click on here we can go and see what what the usage was and we can see here that it was actually ie which is not the not a first person pronoun usage at all so that's the idea of the plot tool. And then, of course, we can start doing clustering. And we can see then here are two word clusters. Maybe we want three word clusters like this. Uh, we have our and so on. Again, this everything's paged. Just got to be careful with time here. Everything's paged. But of course, we can see all the results if we want. But this is not good when there's a huge data set. Engram, so it's pretty similar to the original tool, but I hope you'll see that everything's a little bit more snappy and kind of easier to kind of navigate and use. And the paging makes a considerable advantage, brings in a considerable advantage when you have big data sets, which, I'll, um, which this can now handle. The Engram tool is now separate from the Costa tool because if you want to do a detailed Engram analysis like this, we can see we now have 453 um, Engram tokens. We can go through these, but a lot of people are interested, of course, it, not only in um, this Engrams, but maybe uh, open slot Engrams, lexical frames they're called by some people. And this allows you now to have this Engram lexical, sorry, open slot Engram feature. So we can have a three word Engram, look at which of these Engrams appear with open slots and now we can see that we something the 
is the most frequent open slot three word n-gram and so on. So of course we don't need to have we, we could just look at all of the results as well like this. So we get these like the of, at of and so on, not so interesting. But if you, um, if you want to focus on a particular word within an open slot n-gram, then that can be a useful function. And I'll just quickly show you the, the, um, the colligate tool as well, which is fairly standard. So these are the colligates of we, we see, we know ourselves and we, we, the colligate of itself. And here's the word frequency. Um, there's the word frequency, pretty standard. That's 161,000 tokens. And we can paste through them, as you can see here. Of course, we can also just search for a particular word and see how what the frequency of that is. And then keywords. Now we get something interesting because traditionally keyword analysis would be quite complicated for a lot of people because you've got multiple corpora having to import these and, and, and so on. But now with this tool, if you click the keyword tool, it'll say no reference corpus has been loaded. So you can go back to the uh, open uh, the, to the corpus manager and simply select a reference corpus. So at the moment, this was the um, target corpus, the uh, AMIO 6J academic corpus. So we can click on the reference corpus section. Hope you can see all that. Let me just expand it a little. There. So we still have these pre-built corpora that we can choose from. So of course we could choose from American English compared with British English. We could do the British learned comparison, or we could stay with American English and just pick the full corpus as the reference corpus. So now we have a target corpus, which is learned, the reference corpus, which is the full MEO6 corpus, just click okay. And now at the bottom here, maybe I will expand this a little bit more now. Now you can see at the bottom, we have the reference corpus showing 500 files and a million words. And of course, now if we click on the keyword tool, we'll get the keywords. You will notice, and I don't like this, but it seems to be something that people want, is that instead of just showing the word, we get a whole lot of other information. Like we get the rank, we got the frequency in the target corpus, frequency in the reference corpus, uh, the range in the target corpus, the number of files, the range in the reference corpus. We get normed frequencies for all the results as well. And then we get the likelihood score, which would be key, um, the keyness score, um, log likelihood and so on. We also have an effect size measure. And of course, all of these can be um, changed as we like. So you'll notice here that the actual keywords here don't look very key um, of an X and learning and so on. And this was has been pointed out by Jesse Egberg and his team um, that the traditional log likelihood measure is not very good at picking out keywords. So if we go to the tool settings and go to the keyword here, we can see that the standard tool, the standard uh, likelihood measure is log likelihood, but we have a choice to go to text dispersion, which is what Jesse Egbert and others were proposing. So if we choose this text measure, text dispersion keyness measure, and apply that, and then start again, we'll see now that the results, the keyword scores will be slightly different, actually considerably different. More importantly, the actual keywords are much more now what we would consider to be keywords in academic language. Um, and that's as you can see here, we, we've got academic English, so we would expect these words to be the keywords. So we can now look at these and see how they are. Let's do that. Oh, this that needs to be that's slightly off in its formatting there for some reason. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the basic tool here that I've developed, and I hope already you can see that. Um, it's it's been designed to work with bigger data sets through its paging functions and so on, but it's also designed now to more easily incorporate um, bigger, uh, sorry, different statistical measures and different functions. I'll show you I'll show you a little bit of uh, the a back um, the underside to Ancon just for a second here. Um, okay, so what you're looking at here is the raw code for Ant Conk. Hope you can all see that. Now, um, as I just said, it, 
this new design allows for more functions and features to be added. And why is that? I hope you can see this, but each of these things, we have to tool cluster, tool collocate, tool corpus viewer, tool file, keyword list. Each of these programs are effectively independent of all the others. So it's possible for me or you or someone else to develop a tool, like basically one of these folders, and then put it into this program and run it. That's a huge difference from the previous versions because before everything was kind of merged together and it was it was one big mess of code. This allows you basically to have everything independently operating. So we have a UI, a interface. Here's the interface for this tool, for the keyword tool. And then we have the settings. You can see the settings here. These are the settings. We have a controller tool, we have a viewer tool, and we have the, the main tool that puts everything together. So if, in effect, if you can develop a single tool, it can be put into the program and used. I'm gonna show you one more little um, back um, secret file, but not really that secret. As I just said, um, you can, uh, just a second, uh, just one moment. Ah, just a second, it's not so easy to do, just a second. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you the, um, the database that is generated by Anconc as well. So we've just been analyzing this data. What we can also do is go to save and effectively output the data itself. So if I go to save and I, and I uh, just a second, let me do it this way. Yeah, okay. Let's do it this way. Oh, sorry. Save data tables. So what I can do is I can export the results and I'm gonna put it into this folder. Okay. And now if we go to the folder, just checking the time. I know the time's coming up. I'm just, I'm nearly finished. So if we go to the folder, then we can see these results are saved and we can go in here and we can see all the, the tables that were used to generate these results as CSV files. And if I look here, this will then be the CSV file for the quick concordance results that we just saw a, a few moments ago, the however results. And of course, these can then be exported into another tool and analyzed accordingly. And more importantly, even than that, is that the database itself can be exported so that we can see exactly what tables are produced by the, the software. As you can see here, we've got the, this is a different data set, but this is the corpus itself. This is the quick concordance line results. And here are the plot results, uh, or not so many there, uh, the cluster results and so on. Okay, so let me, let me finish this demo uh, and go back to the slides for a moment, because I do want to talk briefly about the last part of the talk, just a second. Sorry, just a second. Okay, so uh, that is a very quick demonstration of Anconc. So uh, I, I want to spend the last minute or so, two minutes, talking about uh, developing software for a broad user base. Okay, so um, when developing software like Anconc and so on, what are the considerations that you need to think about? Well, the first thing is, who is the software for? So um, if you're developing your own software or you, you're writing scripts, you have to always consider who the software is for initially, because otherwise you cannot basically design the software to meet their needs. So is it for researchers? Is it for teachers? Is it for learners? Is it for English only speakers? Or is it for a multilingual international community? So if it's only for English speakers, then the software interface can be all in English and all the file processing can be only for English and so on. But if it's for a multilingual community, then you need to consider designing your software to allow the interface to be translated into other languages, for the, the data to be possibly not English, it could be Japanese or Chinese or Korean or some other language. And also to, cons to consider people with disabilities, uh, the accessibility issue. So, I, I, of course, Anconc has been designed to consider a broad user base, so it considers all of these people. So it can be used 
by multilingual international uh, an international community the interface itself is now very easy to translate into any other language basically it's just one file that i need to translate the entire interface into a different language and in terms of disability things like making the font sizes bigger making the color contrast easy to see and so on having options to change the colors and so on are all important features which this tool has it's also then important to consider what the software is for. Is it for discourse analysis or critical discourse analysis or more traditional linguistics analysis? Or is it for data-driven learning, corpus methods training? Uh, and Kong is, again, it's for a broad audience, so it's kind of designed for everybody here. But as I said, it initially was designed for data-driven learning, and it's kind of grown from there. But if you're developing your own software, who is it for and what is it for? And design it for those purposes. And two more important questions here really are who will create and maintain the software and how will the software be, be created, maintained and updated. So in my case, I'm developing, so I'm just looking at the comments here. Oh yeah, just, there's somebody's asked about the information about the pre-built corporate. We can have that discussion in the Q&A. Uh, but in my case, the software is, is developed by me on my own. So I'm not going to be too worried about um well i have to worry about um uh, versioning of the software but i'm not having to worry as much about commenting the code for other people to understand and so on but of course these are important features and become more important as more people get involved with the with the development and how will it be developed is it based on university grants and donations and things like patreon pa patrons or is it just your own love that you will do in your free time. In the case of Ancong, it's basically my own passion. So um, I do most of the work on my own, but I have received grants from the university, from the university and the government. I do get donations from PayPal, which is very nice, and also patrons on the Patreon system. Um, I have some very supportive members there, which is all great. And are you going to do the work at home or at, at university and so on? I tend to work on Ancong in my weekends and at night. Um, because it's my passion. And then if, when you're thinking about developing software, you always have to be considering about what should be prioritized. Security, safety, documentation, new tools, new features, promotion of the software itself, advertising, getting applications. I've listed these in what I consider to be the priority for Antconc itself. Primarily, I've designed it for security, safety, for ease of use in terms of documentation. I'm less concerned about new tools and new features, and I'm very much less concerned about promotion and advertising. Uh, as I said, I almost never present on just the software. Uh, I don't need funding applications for it because it's my own passion. But if you're developing your own software, you have to consider which of these are you going to prioritize first. If you prioritize features and tools, probably the documentation will suffer and people might not be able to use what you've developed and so on and then we come to the issue about reproducibility and replicability it's really important um, to have a versioning strategy with either with through some kind of github upload approach and documenting things and so on and what license are you providing to the users? There's a lot of people talking about open source software now, and Anconc has not been open source up till now. I'm always considering making it open source, but in the Q&A, we can perhaps discuss why I haven't, um, but that's something else to consider. For a broad user base, I would say most people do not care about open source software. The majority of users in the world especially those who are not interested in developing the software themselves would not be very interested in open source. They want the software to work more than to be open source, but it's something to consider when you're developing software. Final thoughts. So is Antconc or any other packaged app damaging the field of corpus linguistics? And this is definitely something to consider because uh, there is a move towards developing open source software to develop scripts that everybody can pass around and use and put them into their uh, their papers and so on and Adcock isn't really like that it's a closed source freeware but closed source tool and in some sense it is damaging the field because it prevents this replicability and inter uh, and and openness in the field um, but there is definitely a place 
for a tool like AntConc. And as it evolves, who knows, it might become open source in the future. But um, it, it, what, it, what I want to say here is that if you are a user of AntConc, that is great. And, and don't worry too much about people who are saying, oh, you should be developing your own tools. You should be coding yourself. Um, there is a place for a, a, a standard, reliable, safe to use tool. But th there's also a place for these scripts and programs as well. So if you are tied to Anconc or any other package software, but you want to do something beyond that, then definitely think about uh, looking at scripting, looking at coding yourself, because um, it can help. And I'll just finish with one last slide here. So there is a case for programming. If you program your own tools, you can do analyses not possible with packaged apps. You can tailor the output to your own needs. You can use the hardware of your choice, whether it's Mac or Linux or, or Windows. You and others can check and validate and share the code. And you can sometimes, not always, but sometimes complete the analysis faster. So there is a lot of advantages. But remember that your programming skill level will be a determining factor. So just copying and pasting and running somebody else's ready-built script is not programming. That's just copy and pasting. So if you want to be able to be flexible and have things validated and have things work better, you, you, it's, you need to go beyond just copying and pasting and actually learn to code. And if you're interested in coding, uh, I just I did uh, write a chapter for the, a practical handbook of corpus linguistics on exactly this topic recently. So uh, if you're interested, check out that book. And I will finish there. Thank you.